In 1989, when my wife Kathy and I first moved to New York City, less than 1% of the population of Center City, New York, was attending a gospel-centered church. Today, by God's grace, that number has grown to 5%. Now God has given us a pretty audacious vision to work with churches across the city to try to triple that figure to 15% in the next decade. If that happens, we'd have tens of thousands more people bringing the gospel into the culture-making fields of media, finance, law, the arts, and beyond. Because the gospel changes everything, if there were thousands of changed lives, this could be a vision that brings about radical philanthropy, profound racial reconciliation, and real social justice. If this vision is realized, we might see a humane city with ripple effects which could extend to other cities across the country and around the globe. We're launching this vision with the RISE campaign. It's our hope that God would build up the body of Christ as we've never seen before so that we could serve our neighbors and help the city flourish like never before. Why am I telling you this? Because we need your prayers. Please visit rise.redeemer.com slash rise and pray to learn more. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 11 and 18 to 21. <clears throat> Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you, riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels from Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Al Qaeda's flocks will be gathered to you, the ramps of Nebaioth will serve you. They will be accepted as an offering at my altar, and I'll adorn my glorious temple. Who are these who fly along like clouds, like doves to their nests? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead are the ships from Tarshish, bringing your children from afar. With your silver and gold, to the honor of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Foreigners will rebuild your walls, and their kings will serve you. Though in anger I struck you, in favor I will show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut, day or night, so that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations, their kings led in triumphal procession. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then all your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. They are the shoot I have planted, the work of my hands, for the display of my splendor. The word of the Lord. The passage you just had read 
is talking to us about one part of our vision. The Rise campaign is unfurling a, a, a future for us in the city. We want it to be based on the way in which we have always been uh, ministering in the city. The, our vision for operation in the city has always been this, where we have, this is in your bulletin, it's I think somewhere, it's certainly on the website. Our vision is, as a church of Jesus Christ, Redeemer exists to help build a great city for all people through a movement of the gospel that brings personal conversion, community formation, social justice, and cultural renewal to New York City, and through it, the world. And when we talk about cultural renewal, where we, we mean that Christians are to integrate their faith with their work, and as you're gonna see here in a minute, we believe what that does is that really has a wholesome effect on the way human life is lived in the world, which is on our culture. Now, the passage you just had read, at first it looks like uh, the Israelites are coming back from exile. You know, the Israelites first were in exile in Egypt, later they were in exile in Babylon. It certainly looks like they're coming back uh, from exile to Jerusalem. They are now going to experience a time of great economic prosperity, but if you look a little closer, you'll see that what's actually being depicted here is not something that ever happened in human history. In fact, it's nothing that could happen in normal human history. All the wealth of all the nations of the entire world, in fact, a lot of these names that you and I don't mean, it doesn't mean much to us, but Sheba is the, was the ultimate south for a reader at that time. Uh, Epha and, um, and Nebioth, for example, and Kedar would be ultimate north. It's saying that all the nations in all the world are not only bringing all their wealth to Jerusalem, but they're not doing it out of coercion. It's not, they're not coming uh, to give tribute because they've been conquered, but they've been attracted by the uh, light of the Lord. And as verse 6 says, in other words, in praise of the Lord, in praise of the Lord, it's, they're, they're coming to bring all their wealth as offerings to God. Not only that, if you get down to verse 18, you'll notice there's no more violence anywhere. Uh, and in verse 20, there's no more sorrow anywhere, and there's no more sun or moon because of the light of God. What this is is a vision of the new heavens and new earth. This is paradise restored. This is God putting everything right at the end of time. And therefore, there's a sense in which to read this uh, is to see a fulfillment of paradise as God made it in Genesis. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, you'll see how we had paradise and we lost paradise, and this is paradise restored. Therefore, uh, Isaiah 60 has to be read in light of uh, not only what God originally intended the world to be, but also in light of what bad things happen. So it's both a fulfillment of the promise of Genesis and a reversal of some of the curses of Genesis. And that's how I wanna show you what this passage teaches us about work. Because the thing, you read this, and the one thing that we kind of miss, it's, it's so big that it's, it's right in front of us, but you miss when you read it, is this. In the original paradise, God put work. And in paradise restored, there's work. Well, what is the wealth of the nations? Uh, what is gold and silver? What are flocks and grain? It's the product of our work, and they're all being brought to God to offer it up to God in joy, in praise, out of worship, not out of coercion. And therefore, what this passage teaches us, in fact, what the entire Bible teaches us, is a great deal about the importance of work. In fact, let me show you three things that the text tells us about, which is the importance and dignity of work, right? the broken pr purpose of work, and the healing of work. Uh, the importance and dignity of it, but the uh, broken purpose of work, and the healing of it, okay? Briefly today, but here it is. Number one, the first thing this teaches us as part of what everything else in the Bible teaches us is about the goodness and dignity of work and of, of all work. Virtually all other ancient creation accounts if you go look them up, you'll always see that work is always an evil or something very demeaning. So remember Pandora's box? 
Pandora's box was a Greek myth about the fact that Pandora was given a box by the gods and everything was fine in the world. And Pandora said, don't open that box. And she opened the box and all the evils of the world came out, including what? Work. Uh, the Enuma Elish, which was a Mesopotamian uh, myth about the origin of the world. Uh, the gods create the world and then they create human beings. You know why? Because when they created the world, they saw the world would take upkeep. And Marduk, uh, who's the, the chief god, says, I will bring into being a lowly primitive creature. I will call him man. To him shall be charged the labor so the gods may have rest. So the point is, uh, work was something too demeaning for God or the gods. Human beings were created as just people who had to keep up the place. And so over and over you see the uh, idea that uh, in most other ancient origin myths and ancient origin uh, creation accounts, uh, work is demeaning, work is evil, work is bad. And then you go to Genesis. And in Genesis, you see God working with his hands in the dirt in joy. And when he creates paradise and he puts human beings in paradise and makes everything beautiful and blissful, everything's perfect, he he gives us work. Why? Because that's part of, in God's creation, what a good life is, what a perfect life is, what a blissful life is. He puts human beings into the garden to till it and to care for it. He gives us work. And so, you know, um, years before Karl Marx, the God of the Bible was a manual laborer. He was a manual laborer. He had his hands in the dirt. And in fact, when he comes into the world in the form of Jesus Christ, he doesn't come the way a Greek God would. He doesn't come as an aristocratic philosopher, nor does he come as a Roman God would. He doesn't come in as a, as a general. He comes in as a carpenter, what we would call a working stiff. Now, the, the idea that work is something God does, it's not too demeaning for him, and something he creates us in paradise to do, that, that idea of the goodness and the dignity of all kinds of work, by the way, the work, the, uh, the silver and gold that's coming in is the work of miners. Flocks and grain are the, is the work of shepherds, farmers. All kinds of work has dignity, including what you and I would call menial work. So, for example, nobody, nobody drew out the implications of what the Bible said about work, um, better than Martin Luther. Martin Luther, for example, went to passages in the Bible and he noticed a few things. For example, the Bible says that God feeds us all. God feeds every living thing. Did you know that? Okay. And yet the, the, the food doesn't magically appear on our tables. So how is God feeding us? Through farmers, through the drivers who drive the, 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 uh, the food to, uh, uh, through, this is what Martin Luther would say, through the girl, the maid the, the, at the, on the farm who milks the cow, these are the fingers of God. God is caring for you. God is feeding us through them. And therefore, God is actually caring for his creation through ordinary work. That's how he does it. Here's another place where um, Martin Luther noticed that the Bible says God makes the, uh, the bars of your gate secure. Now that, you know, when a city had, had gates and had bars on the gates, that made them secure. And, uh, but Martin Luther says, okay, so the Bible says that God makes your, your society secure. How does he do that? He says, well, through good laws and law enforcement and politics and government. These aren't necessary evils. These are ways in which God is actually caring for his creation. All work, all work is God caring for his creation. In fact, listen, <clears throat> the work of cleaning up your house or apartment, maybe you'll do it. Maybe you'll pay somebody to do it. It's certainly not what you call high-tech, high-skill labor. But if somebody doesn't do it, you're going to die. You've got to clean your house or you're going to die. God takes care of you. God cares for his creation. God loves and cares for his creation through ordinary human work. And therefore, all kinds of work, even the most simple kinds of work, 
in God's eyes is good. In fact, God, in fact, God is using that. Now, do you have that understanding? That is a Christian, that is a deeply Christian understanding. And if you, if you have it, we got to move on here. If you have it, it means a lot. It makes a great deal of difference. Let me just give you four or five. Number one, we, it gets rid of class snobbery. We live in a city that valorizes high-paying work, uh, work that takes talent and technical skill, work that changes the world. Oh, that's the kind of job we want to have. Nobody wants to push a broom. Nobody wants to clean a house. Nobody, that's just menial work. And if you have your Christian theology screwed on straight, you will not look down at anybody. You will, you will not have that kind of class snobbery. Secondly, there's a whole lot of us, especially in a place like New York, who have been pushed either by our own fears, our own desires, I'll get to this in a second, or by our families into jobs that we really don't like, we're not really good at, we're kind of dying on the inside, but we had to go there, why? Because status, because money, you gotta have a good job, not just any kind of job. And of course, a lot of us are actually being very unhappy because we do, do not see the dignity of all work, and yet if you have your theology screwed on straight, you will. Or here's one more thing. If it's really true that God is caring for creation through our work, so everyone who's doing their work and doing it well is actually doing God's will, in fact, is pleasing God. See, in some ways, it simplifies things. How can you do work in a God-honoring way? How can you do your work in a distinctively Christian way? Do it well. Do it well. You know, if you clean up your house, then do it well, and that's pleasing to God. Or my favorite illustration, as some of you know, is what is the most God-honoring way, what is the most Christ-honoring way to be a pilot? The answer is land the plane so that you can use it again. In other words, do that well. You don't say, well, what does it mean? To, what does it mean for me to please God as I, as I uh, pilot this plane? Land the plane. Anything you do well. And here's one more thing, which is actually pretty interesting. If all work, all work has got this dignity, that doesn't just mean blue-collar and white-collar jobs equally. It also means religious and secular jobs, so-called. It, it means that you serve God by doing your job well, whatever it is. You don't have to be in a religious calling in order to please God. Dick Lucas, who was a... Uh, um, a minister uh, and a preacher in London for many years, I heard a, a recording he did of a sermon on Joseph some years ago. And uh, as you know, Joseph in the Bible was a civil magistrate, and he was serving God and, and um, blessing the nations by simply his work as a civil magistrate in a non-believing pagan uh, uh, government, which was Egypt. And this is what Dick says. And I wrote this down. He says, if you were to go up to a book table at a church and you saw a biography with the title, The Man God Uses or The Woman God Uses, you would immediately think it was the story of a missionary or a minister or a specialist in some sort of spiritual work, pastoring, mission, leading Bible studies. That's because the church has conditioned you to think this way. But in fact, what you have here in Joseph is a highly successful manager. He's not a preacher. He's not a missionary. He's not leading a Bible study group. I think that being a preacher, missionary, leading a Bible study group in many ways can be easier because it's the black and the white is easier to see when you're doing it right, you're doing it wrong. There's not much gray. So it's often hard to get Christians to see that God is telling us and is willing to greatly use men and women in medicine, law, business, the arts. That is the great shortfall today. You see the dignity and importance of work? Now, secondly, however, there's a brokenness to work. Uh, I said you can only understand Isaiah 60 if you understand Genesis. And if you go back to Genesis, you, see, you not only see the creation of paradise in which God puts work, but you also see another place where work is at the center of things, but it's the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, the story of the Tower of Babel is certainly a place where people got together to work. They were going to build a tower, but we're told they, were, they decided to get together to work to build a tower to make a name for themselves. 
In other words, they decide they were going to they were going to work for themselves. They were going to work for status, for power, to get an identity, to say, "Look at this great tower that I have built." See, there's a there, there's a great example of this, by the way, when Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter four is looking at this great the great castle and the great the great palace he's in and, and the great city he has built, and he says, "Is not this great Babylon?" that I have built for the glory of my power. In other words, to make a name for yourself, you say, because I'm successful, because I'm good, because I'm talented, because I've done this work really well, now I can feel good about myself. You make a name for yourself. And the result, by the way, when people used work like that, was fragmentation. See, when you're working for your own personal advancement, if that's the ultimate reason you're doing your job, then you do it at the expense of other individuals, of other groups, and of course the human race fragments. Uh, you know the story of the Tower of Babel, uh, they, it fragments into various nations and ethnic groups and all because, they, because of the brokenness of work. What do you mean by the brokenness of work? Well here it's reversed. All the nations are coming together. They're all finally unified, why? Because they're all offering up the fruit of their work to God, they're offering it up. It's an offering. Now, the reality is all work is done for something. All work is offered up for something. You're working for somebody. You're working for some ultimate good. What is it? You can say, well, I try to do it. What is the ultimate? Of course, you've got multiple reasons when you do a job. What's the ultimate reason you're working? Are you working to get a name for yourself? Are you working for your own personal advancement, status, and power? Is that the actual bottom line? Because if it is, everything else breaks down. John Coltrane was a jazz, a great jazz saxophonist. Uh, I do not know much about his life or how, uh, you know, how his life went after this, but I do know this. In a very famous, famous album called A Love Supreme, uh, John Coltrane wrote the liner notes. And in the liner notes, he wrote these very, very famous words. He said, quote, during the year 1957, I experienced by the grace of God a spiritual awakening. At that time, in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music, to inspire them for living meaningful lives, because there certainly is meaning to life. All praise to God. Now, if you parse that carefully, this is what he's saying. He, like all other human beings, is under the curse of Babel. That is to say, his music was a way of making a name for himself. He was doing music so he could say, if people applaud me, then I have meaning in life. Then I know I'm significant. If I'm good, if I'm the best, then I know I've got meaning in life. But then he had an experience of God's love. He had an experience of God's grace, and it changed what? It changed the reason he did his music. He says, when I experienced that love, I turned around and said, from now on, I want to offer up my music to make other people happy and as an offering to God. Here's what's happening. When music was the meaning of his life, the music was actually about him. I don't know what he said to himself, but he realized when, when music was the meaning of his life, when that was the way he got a name for himself, the music was about him. When God became the meaning of his life, when he became assured of who he was through the love of God, suddenly the music wasn't about him. It wasn't about, look at me, look at me. Suddenly the music, his work was not for his sake. His work was for the music's sake. It was for the listener's sake because it was for God's sake. That when it became an offering to God, it became something he was doing for others and not for himself. And it changed everything. There's a man, I remember some years ago, I read an article in the New York Times by a writer. And he said, when writing was my main goal in life, it was my main meaning in life, he says, I made the quality of my work the measure of my worth. I made the quality of my work the measure of worth. And as a result, he says, what was really weird was he couldn't write. Because either he had to believe this is really good, I couldn't admit it was anything wrong with it because it had to be good because if it wasn't good, then I didn't have a name. 
didn't know who I was. Or if it wasn't perfect, it was trash, it was terrible, throw it away. Every one of us needs some deep assurance of our value and worth. We need to find some kind of meaning apart from work or else we'll work to save our souls. We'll work to save our souls. Even if you don't believe in God, you're still working to save your soul. You're still working to get a name for yourself. As Coltrane said, when work was my meaning in life, see, it was all about me. But when it became something I could offer up to God because I knew his love, then, I, then it became about the work, about the music, or about the people, or it, because it was offered to God. That's what you've got to have. Unless, if you're working for yourself, the work will destroy you. It'll enslave you. But if you can offer it to God, it won't. Well, how can that happen? Lastly, what's interesting about this passage is that it is a return from exile. You say your sons and your daughters are coming from afar. It is a picture of coming home from exile, but it's all. It's all the nations of the earth. This isn't the Jews coming back from Babylon or the Israelites coming up from Egypt. This is this is, the, this is the healing of the ultimate exile. What was the ultimate exile? I'll tell you what it was. It was in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve decided they're going to live for themselves instead of for God. God exiled them. And the marks of that exile, what does that mean? Restlessness. You know, it's interesting. When the, when the, when the Jews came back from Babylon or when the Israelites came back from Egypt, God always said, I will bring you back from exile and I will give you rest. Rest. Rest is a deep peace. Rest is a deep fulfillment. And if you're in exile, you're in restlessness. Well, you see, the whole human race, we're all in this. We experience restlessness. So human beings are, are, are cast out of the Garden of Eden. So we experience restlessness. Cain is a wanderer on the earth, restless. And God says, your work will be exhausting now. See, when work is your meaning in life, your ultimate meaning in life, when work is the way you get a self, way you make a name for yourself, it's, it's exhausting. To the, there's a deep exhaustion that no number of vacations will ever satisfy. And God made a, rep made a symbol of it. He says, thorns will come up out of the ground when you're planting grain. Your work now is no longer going to be very satisfying. Thorns will come up instead of grain. So we're all in exile, and our work has been broken, and we're all experiencing the thorns, and we're all experiencing the exhaustion, we're all experiencing the restlessness. And it's because we work the way we do. But God sends his son, Jesus Christ, to earth. Listen. He comes as a worker, Jesus, a working stiff. But not only that, he comes as a wanderer. He says, foxes have holes, birds have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But more than that, he gets thorns, a crown of thorns, pounded into his skull. And on the cross, when he's crying out, my God, my God, my thou forsake me, what is he experiencing? Is he experiencing peace? Is he experiencing fulfillment? No, he's experiencing cosmic restlessness, absolute emptiness. He cries out. He's miserable. Why? He's taking the exile. He's taking the curse. He's taking the thorns. All the stuff that we deserve for living for ourselves, he's taking it. He's taking the penalty we deserve. He's taking the, the just penalty for our sins so that when we believe in him, we receive his love and his grace without earning it, without work, right? It says, by the way, in Hebrews 4, therefore we see the promise of entering God's rest still remains. For we who have believed in Christ enter that rest. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who believes in him rests from his own work just as God did from his. What this means is this. Look, Jesus is looking at you, as it were, and saying this. If you try to earn your salvation religiously, by trying to live a good life, 
Maybe God will take you to heaven. You'll be exhausted. Or if you try to earn your salvation socially, emotionally, by working very hard to get status so you can feel good about the self. I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm an artist, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. That will exhaust you. It'll grind you into the ground. Oh, but Jesus says, I worked myself to death for you. I was ground into the ground for you. I took the restlessness. I took the homelessness. I took the thorns. And when you see me dying on the cross, that should assure you of my love for you. Receive me as your Savior. Rest in me. And now finally you know who you are. There's your meaning in life. There's your value. And then when you turn with that knowledge, that sense of his love, resting in his work, not in your own, you get a deep rest of soul. Deep, 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 deep rest. That suddenly means your work becomes not about you, but about the work and about the people you're serving. And it becomes a joy. You know, it says there was no sun. There will be no sun, no moon, no need for that in the new heavens and new earth. Why? Because God is the sun. Well, you know, in the Revelation, the same, same um, uh, vision, John says, the lamb is the light of the world. The slain lamb died for you. He can be your light now. He can be your rest now. Let the lamb be your light and your deep rest and let that change your work. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for providing for us the uh, vision for the importance of work, the dignity of work, this explanation for what's wrong with our work. Uh, Father, thank you that through Jesus Christ you reverse the curse of Babel, the curse on our work. But we pray that you would help us apply uh, these goods, apply this, this transforming grace to our hearts and to our lives and especially to our work so that we can be people who integrate our faith with our work. And we truly, because we're building a new human culture, not based on power and status, but on love and service and justice, can really, really change the world, really change the world through our simple daily work. We pray that you would change our work and through that change others. We ask this through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us in praying for gospel renewal, both where you live and in New York City.